Weitzman was one of four recent high-profile suicides in the economics profession, along with Alan Kruger, Emmanuel Fahey, and William Sandom. All of these men were considered top economists. Weitzman was a professor at Harvard who narrowly missed out on the Nobel in 2018. Alan Kruger was at Princeton and had worked at the White House under Obama. The Economics Nobel Prize in 2021 was awarded to many of Kruger's co-authors and he surely would have received it had he lived. Emmanuel Fahey was only 41, but was already tenured at Harvard. He was an up-and-coming economist who was widely regarded. William Sandon was a professor at the University of Wisconsin and a well-respected game theorist, who was again, young, only 50. These four suicides, all of which took place in one year, raised serious questions about the environment in the economics profession. Why do some of the most respected, accredited and accomplished members of the profession want to take their own lives? Suicide is a complicated topic and it would be wrong to assume that only one thing was responsible for any given suicide. Undoubtedly, each of these men had things going on that none of us know about. But in the case of Weitzman, observers drew clear links between his suicide and his professional status. Weitzman was a climate change economist, known for the Dismal Theorem. This is the idea that the outcome of climate change is potentially so terrible that by any sensible calculation, we should invest everything we can to prevent it now. Alright, what you're listening to is In 2018, William video. Nordhaus, another climate... So what you've been listening to is a video by the uh, video, the channel on learning economics. Uh, my name is Jamie, and today we're playing guitar. Uh, this is a series where we're trying to play guitar every single day, and we've had quite a bit of trouble with the audio. So um, last few streams, not super good audio. So what we're going to actually do is just the output from the mix pre what you what i'm hearing in my headphones is where you're going to hear in yours so unfortunately you will hear my guitar that's a problem and you want to watch this video without that noise uh you can see the video in the description below of this live stream it's called the toxic culture of the economics profession by unlearning economics and uh there is a video to go along with it but it's in a format that I feel can be listened to. So that's what we're going to do today while I do some work on guitar. And if you have anything you're working on, feel free to you know, throw this on. You can turn off the sound, whatever you need to do. And uh, we're going to do an hour of work. As per usual, we're working out of the Hal Leonard Guitar Method Book 1 on pages 12 to 18. First, I'm going to tune up, get some stuff going here. We're going to play this video. There's a little bit of a content warning. I think they already mentioned it. Uh, Self-harm and depression. So uh, nothing insane, but if those things are triggering to you, you'll want to be aware. Let's get going. Change economist who was more sanguine about its consequences won the Nobel Prize. The committee made the strange decision to pair Nordhaus with an economist from a different area, Paul Roma, who was a macroeconomist focused on technological change, rather than a climate change economist. It's not usual for the prize to be awarded to economists from two separate fields. It has been reported that even Nordhaus himself was surprised by this pairing. When he found out he'd won, he asked, did they not also give it to Marty? Whatever the Nobel Committee's reasons, narrowly missing out on the Nobel seems to have been a big factor in Weizmann's mental health. The New York Times reported, Colleagues said that Professor Weizmann had grown increasingly despondent after being passed over for the Nobel Prize in Economics last year, and had left a note questioning whether he any longer had the mental acuity to contribute to his field. What I want to explore in this video are the features of the toxic culture in economics which led to this kind of situation. This video is motivated by making the field of economics a better place so that things like this no longer happen. But I'm going to warn you, the video is not always sympathetic to practices in economics or powerful actors within the profession, and that's for very good reason. Economics has been called the king of the social sciences. It's not especially difficult to find comments from economists proclaiming the superiority of their field. For example, one well-known paper by Edward Lazier has the following abstract. Economics is not only a social science, it is a genuine science. Like the physical sciences, economics uses a methodology that produces refutable implications and tests these implications using solid statistical techniques. In particular, economics stresses three factors that distinguish it from other social sciences. Economists use the construct of rational individuals who engage in maximizing behavior. Economic 
models adhere strictly to the importance of equilibrium as part of any theory. Finally, a focus on efficiency leads economists to ask questions that other social sciences ignore. These ingredients have allowed economics to invade intellectual territory that was previously deemed to be outside the discipline's realm. My eyes, the goggles do nothing. The first paragraph of the paper continues. By almost any market test, economics is the premier social science. The field attracts the most students and draws the attention of policymakers and journalists and gains notice, both positive and negative, from other scientists. In large part, the success of economics derives from its rigor and relevance as well as from its generality. The economic toolbox can be used to address a large variety of problems drawn from a wide range of topics. Unlike the first quote, this one is correct. In terms of intellectual prestige, political influence, funding and job opportunities, economics is one of the best degrees or PhDs you could hope for. The result of all this is, to be blunt, that the field is institutionally arrogant. There are quite a few high-profile cases of economists invading intellectual territory, as Lazia puts it, but clearly failing to understand the terrain they are invading. They are prone to thinking their skills and abilities give them a license to wade in on any topic that takes their fancy. A recent high-profile example involved economists turning their attention to the opioid crisis in the USA. Over the past decade or so, tens of thousands of people have died from the use of prescription opioids. A controversial way to deal with this is to engage in what's called harm reduction by prescribing the alternative drug of heroin. Although heroin is still harmful, it's less so than the prescription opioids, especially if it's administered by health professionals in a safe and sterile setting. For this reason, many public health experts endorse the harm reduction approach, with systematic reviews of hundreds of studies supporting this conclusion. Unfortunately for the public health experts, a handful of economists decided that this was wrong. The Economist research makes the case that harm reduction will backfire, first by saving the lives of active drug users, yes, that means one of their arguments is that drug users surviving longer is bad, actually, and second, by increasing the chance of overdose by reducing the costs of using, since better care means less risk. According to this argument, people may take more if they think they'll be cared for when things go wrong, which will result in more overdosing. The research received a lot of criticism, partly because their measure of harm reduction is the passing of legislation, which public health experts pointed out doesn't necessarily translate into the policy being enforced in practice. Additionally, rather than using actual drug distribution or use, they used Google searches of the names of drugs, as well as arrest data, which public health experts pointed out are not the same thing. I'm not against interdisciplinary criticism. Surely there are some areas where economists can help inform public health and vice versa. This is not my area of expertise either, and there's an outside chance the economist could be right about harm reduction. What I want to draw attention to is their attitude. In response to these criticisms of their research, one of the authors, Jennifer Doliak, said, I find it utterly disheartening that a discipline as important as public health is filled with so many people who collectively have so little understanding of rigorous research methods. Advocates should acknowledge that many of their strongly held priors are not evidence-based. Anecdotes and personal experience are valuable, but are not a substitute for rigorous causal inference methods. So when investigating opioid addiction, the economists first didn't know about the extensive public health research on the matter. Second, they dismissed out of hand the criticisms from people with more knowledge of the topic than themselves. In fairness to the Brookings Institute, where the paper was published, they said they didn't endorse Doliak's response to the criticism and reaffirmed that public health research was invaluable. But all of this is an extreme version of a more general trend in economics, which aggressively values its own methods above those from other disciplines. Lazia's paper on economic imperialism gives a large number of examples, ranging from sociology to business to law, where economists have imposed their approach on that of other disciplines. One 2015 paper by Foucault et al. shows that economics papers do not pay attention to other disciplines as much as other disciplines pay attention to economics papers. 
This table shows the percentage of academics who agree or strongly agree with the statement, in general, interdisciplinary knowledge is better than knowledge obtained by a single discipline. Economists are the only group who majority disagree with this statement. This table shows the citations from the flagship journals of economics, political science, and sociology to their own disciplines and to the other two. The journals are shown by the different rows on the left-hand side, while the places they cite from are across the columns on the top. Every discipline is more likely to cite itself, as shown by the large numbers down the diagonal line, but there is a clear asymmetry in the citations across disciplines. At the American Economic Review, the top political science and sociology journals are cited less than 1% of the time. 40.3% of citations from the American Economic Review are to the top 25 economics journals, whereas only 0.8% are to the top 25 political science journals. Political science cites top economics journals about five times more than the other way around. For sociology, that number is closer to eight times. A more recent paper by Angris et al. confirmed this with more systematic data. This graph shows the percentage of citations from the different social sciences, with economics in solid black. Because the black line is clearly below the green, red and yellow lines, the graph confirms that economics is insular relative to political science, sociology and anthropology, respectively. The Angris et al. do caveat Foucault's findings in two ways. Firstly, psychology is, curiously, even more insular than economics. The blue line is either at or below the level of the black line. Secondly, economics is becoming less insular, as the black line has risen somewhat over the period. This is evidence of some improvement, which we'll return to towards the end of the video. Foucault et al. summarise the superiority of economists. Thus, most economists feel quite secure about their value added. They are comforted in this feeling by the fairly unified disciplinary framework behind them, higher salaries that many of them believe reflect some true fundamental value, and a whole institutional structure, from newspapers to congressional committees to international policy circles, looking up to them for answers, especially in hard times. In fact, the recent economic and financial crisis has arguably made the discipline of economics as a whole more, not less, visible, and its expertise more sought after. The deep recessions of the early 1980s and the Great Depression of the 1930s had the same effect. It's a go-kart powered by my own sense of self-satisfaction. So here we have ingredient number one of a toxic discipline, an implicit and often explicit belief that your own approach is superior. I now want to draw your attention to a slightly awkward panel at the American Economics Association entitled The Curse of the Top Five. Okay, it comes from a paper that I'm writing with Pascal Michel, uh, and we plan to submit it to a top five. That's supposed to be a joke, so you don't have to laugh. Okay. <laughs> So, what does the curse of the top five mean? Well, another feature of economics is that it's remarkably hierarchical. The field is dominated by the top schools, the top journals, and the top people. Specifically, the curse of the top five refers to the top five economics journals. Econometrica, the American Economic Review, the Review of Economic Studies, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, and the Journal of Political Economy. Remember that last one. There's strong evidence that being published in the top five dictates promotion and tenure positions. People get boosts just for publishing their papers in the top five, regardless of the quality of the publication. The top five becomes an aspiration, especially for younger economists, and not publishing there is seen as a sign of failure. Naturally, most economists do not and will never publish in the top five, and most that do so will only do it once or twice. Even for those economists published many times in the top five, if they drop out, it is seen as a sign of professional decline. In essence, it's a losing battle for everyone. If you're outside the top five, you feel like a loser. If you're inside the top five, then you're worried you might lose it. I know what some people might be thinking. Hey, aren't the top five journals just the best journals? Why is it bad to acknowledge the best work in the profession? Aren't you just bitter that you don't get published in those journals? Maybe you should improve your research instead of... Alright, shut up now. Recently, an episode emerged which may make you doubt the integrity and professionalism at display in this process. 
Jim Heckman is an editor of the Chicago-based Journal of Political Economy, a top five journal. He is also someone who has pushed against the curse of the top five. The economist Kenneth Judd recently posted to his blog the details of his recent submission to the JPE. The documents below detail the battle I had with GPE regarding a paper I wrote and submitted to GPE in November 2012. Here is the short version. 1. GPE rejected the paper because we did uncertainty quantification, also known as sensitivity analysis. 2. I contacted Jim Heckman regarding this decision, and he told us to change the... Uh, I'm pretty sure this is the voice of Little Joel, so... Or, or is it Big Joel? Or Medium Joel? What's up, Joel? Title, resubmit the paper and that he would handle the new submission. Three, Heckman said that he would reject the paper if, in public comments and not in the paper, I criticize the JPE editor for the hostility to uncertainty quantification. Four, I obeyed Heckman's gag order while we worked on the revision. However, when we sent the revision to JPE, I took my name off the paper. Five, I contacted the University of Chicago asking if Heckman's threats violated their standards for freedom of speech. The answer from UC was emphatic approval of Heckman's threats. Six, the paper came out in JPE in December 2019. Seven, in 2020, I asked JPE if I could publicly display the correspondence regarding this matter. They agreed, and I post the documents below. The emails below show that many people at UC were aware of this conflict. No one expressed any criticism of how JPE treated this paper. While my comments focus on my emails with Heckman, it is clear that all the people who knew about this fully supported Heckman and his threats. Heckman was merely the chief spokesman of a gang of UC professors and administrators In essence, the paper was rejected because the journal didn't rate a method they used, known as uncertainty quantification. The details of this method are, of course, far less important than the drama. It seems that Judd felt he had been threatened by Heckman and took his name off the final paper, which is quite a bold move. But why? The journal's initial response to the paper was as follows. In my first decision letter on this submission, I wrote that I was not optimistic that this process will end well. The initial condition of this paper is just too far away from anything that the JPE would publish. I therefore would understand if you decide to send your paper to a journal with a readership that is more familiar with these models. And if you do decide to resubmit, please include responses to the reviewers. A successful revision would have to convince them as well. So they are outright telling Judd the paper isn't good enough, but giving him some advice which could help to get it published. Judd's reaction to this was interesting. You rich people tell the rest of us to be patient. However, where are you when we play by your rules but get our money stolen or have our papers savaged by editors and references because we are not in the right fight club? Time is running out on my academic career. Stanford is downgrading the status of senior fellows. Stanford people control Hoover money and make sure that it goes to Stanford people. If I find it useful to hammer Monica and the Stanford Economics Department, then I will do so. If you want to take this paper, Yang Yang and Thomas hostage, then so be it. I do not negotiate with terrorists. I have held back for two years on the RDCEP theft, fearful of what Ian and Financing. I am patient, but there is a limit. I now wish that we had just reopened the old file. It would not have mattered who the acting editor was because, as I told you, I would have brought the entire editorial board into this and this would be settled by now. Thugs run JPE and you don't care. Thanks for the info, Ken. You may see Judd's email as slightly over the top. Being rejected is horrible, and Heckman has been quite blunt, as were the referees who reviewed the paper if you read the full exchange. It's not difficult to see the career and financial pressures at play on Judd in this email. Time is running out in his academic career. There is no money. There are gatekeepers preventing him operating as he would like. But it takes quite a sense of entitlement to email an editor about a rejection. Journals receive hundreds, even thousands of submissions, and during my PhD we were basically told never to email an editor in this way. 
there's a vanishingly small chance of it working and it just makes you look bad. Judd is himself an economist at Stanford, which is a top department, like Chicago. Most economists would not have the status or connections to even attempt this kind of decision reversal. In addition, Judd went on to threaten the students of the editorial staff. I can also play this hostage game. Thomas and Yang Ying are my students. Harold and Monica have students. It makes me sick to write this email, but if that is the game we are playing, then so be it. The big difference is that my criticisms of anybody's work will be scientifically valid. They are threatening to abuse editorial power to silence discussions of legitimate issues. Any harm they do to my students will be on your head. In response, Heckman also upped the ante. Ken, I spoke with Harold about your recent string of emails and threats to raise a stink about the handling of your paper in the first round at the JPE. We both agree. God damn, this story is juicy as hell. I did not expect this. Uh, let's keep it going. Uh, if you're joining us, my name is Jamie. I can't play guitar, and today we are playing guitar while listening to the video essay the toxic culture of economics by unlearning economics a channel that i love let's get back to it uh right now they are listening through a juicy uh bit of back and forth between uh an economist and economist economist at stanford uh a professor who was rejected from one of the top five economics journals and he proceeded to berate them over email saying that they were pieces of shit basically and that they should have accepted his uh, paper and then he at the end of the paper and at the end of one of his emails threatened to uh, sort of like do something to some students that were related to people i'm not quite sure um at like the string of of damage but basically he's like a stanford professor in economics and he was threatening to somehow damage the careers of his students if they didn't reconsider his paper for this one journal which is like one of the a very important journal one of the one of the five like important journals to get your stuff published for economics so super juicy at this point, he's thrown his uh, cannonballs at the journal, and this is the editor responding, saying like, man, uh, we have deep respect for you, but it's pretty fucked up that, oh, the, the students are actually uh, some of the editors at the paper, so there's a lot of interconnection, um, and he's basically threatening staff at their paper who are his students or students of his colleagues um, at Stanford. Uh, or work with people at Stanford, have some kind of connection, and they're responding, saying, like, what the fuck? We can't believe you would go there. Uh, we just didn't accept your paper because we didn't think it fit in the journal, which who knows if that's true. So let's keep going. That it will be exceptionally damaging to the handling of your paper at the journal. We have bent over backward out of deep respect for you. A previous editor, Monica P., rejected a very close draft. At my urging, I convinced Harold to reopen the case against considerable precedent. In fact, there is no precedent I know of. I continue to think your paper has great merit, but don't cause a stink and make a delicate situation much, much worse. It's so counterproductive. What rate of discount do you have to go off on these rants against people who respect you and want to encourage your work? Even if you are suicidal, have you no concern about your co-authors? A revised paper along the lines of my letter will very likely be published. If, however, you continue to rub old sores, we will have to reconsider this decision. However angry you may be, do not destroy a very delicate situation with a rant against Monica. Leave it alone, or leave the JPE. Call me a son of a bitch, an idiot, or whatever you like. But let this act of respect for you and your work not be harmed. And just do what you do best. Wonderful economics. So Heckman is now saying that Judd should not push this or the paper will be fully rejected. He is threatening Judd right back. At this stage, I'm sure you're all looking forward to Judd's response, so let's get right to it. The stink portion of my so-called threats to raise a stink would not focus the idiosyncratic details about how she handled the paper, but what was said about economic 
economics methodology, in particular, the prohibition on serious and systemic parameter sensitivity analysis, and the requirement that any second-year PhD students in any field of economics should be able to understand the paper. My threats were only telling you that I wanted to engage economics in discussions about substantive issues. Monica's clear statements demonstrated that my criticisms were not hypothetical, but did represent attitudes of at least one powerful editor. I thought you would have been sympathetic, but now you demand silence. I do not stab people in the back. I do not hide behind anonymity in my comments. I made them openly even signing many of my negative referee reports. I have often suspected retaliation was common in journals, so this does not come as a total surprise. I may be suicidal, but you have hostages. I don't sacrifice young people. So what is the lesson from this episode? Clearly, the JP has a lot of power in this situation, and authors aren't being treated very well. But Judd has a clear sense of entitlement and is pushing things quite aggressively, despite facing a rejection that is commonplace in the discipline. My only takeaway is that there are no heroes. There is a competitive and toxic culture at play, which is making people entitled, blunt, bitter, and mean. On top of the insecurity and competitiveness it created by this hierarchical structure, it's just not that great a way to do economics. Despite their huge importance to individual careers, the top five journals aren't actually that great an indicator of the quality of papers. Many of the most pioneering papers in economics were published outside the top five, with unpublished papers also playing an increasing role, as well as books, which are almost entirely disregarded within the economics profession. There is also a degree of nepotism at play in these journals. There is evidence that economists are much more likely to publish in a journal that is associated with their own university. Top schools hire disproportionately from each other. 60% of the faculty at Harvard and MIT did their PhDs at Harvard or MIT. This is a pretty standard human tendency to go with who you know, and it may partially reflect higher quality at certain universities. However, it definitely creates an unfair disadvantage for those outside the club whose likelihood of getting published or getting a job diminishes. There are reports that people at top departments can run their papers by likely editors before actually submitting them to increase their chances of getting published. Concentrating power in the hands of a few editors and schools where the journals are based also ends up catering to the biases of whomever is in charge. As Heckman, uh, yes, that Heckman, and Moktan put it, Monopolies restrict welfare. Oligopolies do little better. Openness and entry promote productivity, innovation, and the introduction of new ideas. Academic economics risks becoming or remaining a group of top five plodders, putting one foot in front of the other. Emphasis on the top five incentivizes careerism rather than creative scholarship. So here we have ingredient number two of a toxic discipline, an impossibly difficult competition where success, both perceived and real, depends on publishing in a small number of journals. The process of attempting and often failing to get published in these journals turns people into whatever the hell that email exchange was. This is despite the fact that the evidence in favor of this hierarchical system is limited. Now, for the third ingredient of a toxic culture, let's turn to a slightly different issue. Economics has a long-established problem with women. These graphs show the percentage of women awarded degrees across various disciplines, with bachelor's degrees on the right and doctorates on the left. Economics is the thick black line, and you can clearly see it is at the bottom when compared to other disciplines. It hovers around 30% for both ordinary degrees and for PhDs, not showing much progress in recent years. In contrast, women are now the majority in the social sciences, the dashed black line, and in STEM, the thin black line, and in humanities, the yellow line, while they are close to 50% in business, the dotted blue line. These graphs also throw doubt on explanations that revolve around women not liking or being good at maths. Women now choose STEM more than men, and STEM subjects are at least as mathematical as economics. A number of things point to women being unrepresented and undervalued within the profession. Female professors are paid 75% of the salary of male professors. Women account for 13.7% of authorships in economics, around half of the average across the social sciences. Women are less likely to get tenure at their first academic job compared to men, which is no longer the case in other disciplines. 
the so-called leaky pipeline, where women drop out at every level. Women are 36% of undergraduate economic students, 27% of PhDs, 14% of full professors, and only two women have ever won the Economics Nobel Prize. There is also plenty of direct evidence that women face discrimination in economics. The economist Claudia Sam, a macroeconomist who has previously worked at the Federal Reserve, has become something of a crusader against the toxic culture in the discipline. In 2020, she wrote a viral blog post entitled, Economics is a Disgrace. Much of the post is devoted to particular cases of harassment and abuses within the profession, especially of women and of minorities. To give some examples... The new woman economist at the board was asked by the men colleagues at lunch if she satisfied her husband. The woman economics major at Chicago, who went to office hours, she sat on the floor since the room was crowded. Her professor offered her a chair. She said she was fine sitting on the floor. He looked at her and said, I see you like it on your knees. Women do. The tenure of a Native American woman economist was revoked after her men colleagues turned on her. I talk with her regularly. We talk about how she could return to academia after she is healthy again. Do you know how many Native American women are economists? Very few. Do you know how many black economists work at the Fed? One out of 406. Economics is a disgrace. For her efforts, Claudia was summarily fired from the think tank Equitable Growth on the grounds that her blog post put the reputation of equitable growth at risk. Such is the case if you make a stand within our profession. Individually, these are just anecdotes, but together they start to paint a picture which is confirmed by more general surveys and research. The American Economic Association found that half of women say they have been treated unfairly because of their sex, while the same figure for men is 3%. Almost half of women say they have avoided conferences or seminars for fear of harassment. 70% of women said that their colleagues' work was taken more seriously than their own. One paper on the topic looked at how women get less credit for publishing research than men do. In academia, when somebody has published a paper on their own, it's easier to credit them, or blame them if it's me, for what's inside. Publishing with co-authors may dilute your contribution in the eyes of readers and potential employers, and reduce your chance of succeeding relative to publishing solo. Well, it turns out that only women get punished for co-authoring in economics. Men who co-author have just as good a chance of getting tenure as men who author alone, but women who co-author have a reduced chance compared to women who author alone. This is quite possibly because in the absence of information about who contributed what, unconscious biases mean readers assume that men contributed more and that women occupy junior or assistant roles in the research. The study which found this compares the dynamic to sociology, where authors are listed in order of their contribution and where women don't suffer a similar penalty for co-authoring. In an interesting turn of events, this very paper, which was originally circulated as solo authored by Heather Sarson, was eventually published with three other co-authors, including two men. There are some additions to the published paper when compared to the original unpublished paper. There are some robustness checks which vary how they measure things like tenure and research quality, as well as a couple of kind of relevant experiments added about gender bias. But ultimately, a study by a female author about how women get penalised for co-authoring was eventually published as co-authored, even though the main contribution was clearly hers. I wonder why women don't like economics. Oh, and this was all in the Journal of Political Economy, again. Some of the reasons women avoid economics may be more subtle than direct discrimination and implicate the subject matter itself. Economists often study markets, which means a focus on activities and work which involve money changing hands. Yet historically and still today, women engage in activities such as childcare, housework and cooking which are not remunerated directly and therefore have not been noticed as much by economists. Feminist economists have long called for measuring this unpaid labour and integrating it into GDP measures or otherwise reporting it. Female students have been reported to say that they don't choose economics because they did not think that economics was interesting, which is understandable if the subject matter just does not seem relevant to you. This is also backed up by the huge differences in policy opinions between male and female economists, with female economists generally leaning more towards government intervention in economic policy. Men and women are often socialised to see economics differently, and if economists prioritise the male view, it makes sense that women might tend to avoid it. Finally, there are all the little things that deter women, but which men just won't notice unless they're pointed out. 
For a long time, job interviews in economics have taken place in hotels, where young economists go for short interviews with panels from a number of different universities in the rooms of the hotels. It's even been called speed dating for economists. In other words, if you want a job in economics, you have to go into hotel rooms full of old men you don't know and speed date them for the job repeatedly. I wonder why women don't like economics. In many cases, the interviewees are required to sit on the beds of the men who are interviewing them, and there are numerous stories of the men commenting how lucky they were to have such a beautiful woman in their bed. Excuse me while I vomit. So here we have ingredient number three of a toxic culture, a male-dominated discipline which systematically discourages women. To anticipate one objection, am I saying that if economics just had more women, its problems would be solved? Absolutely not. There are many successful women in economics who emulate the worst aspects of its culture. Although this culture may find its roots in a male-dominated environment, it won't budge just by having more women fill the spaces at the top five journals. Jennifer Doliak, who, if you recall, we met earlier when discussing the opioid crisis, is a good example of a woman who exemplified the arrogance of the discipline. Her dismissive response to public health experts on the issue of opioid addiction was as bad as anything I've seen from a man. This is despite the fact that she has pushed efforts to bring more women into the discipline, including being rightly enraged by the co-authoring fiasco with the Heather Sarsons paper we saw earlier. Encouraging more women to pursue economics is a good thing, but it's not enough. So, what kind of culture do we get when we combine our three ingredients? One, insularity and a belief in your own superiority. Two, a hierarchical, competitive and nepotistic internal structure. Three, dominance by men, with the exclusion of women and minority groups. Toxic masculinity is typically thought of as a set of harmful expectations and norms around what it means to be a man. For example, a typical man may be expected to be a breadwinner. You know, I put food on the table. I work hard for the money. So hard for the money. To be physically strong. Come on over here and fight like a man. Fight like a man! Hey, bullet boy, why don't you get out of here before I give you a knuckle sandwich? Oh, Billy, you are all man. Golly, what a hoe. All I have to say is goodbye, bag of bones. Sports, it's a very small part of life. Sports, 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 sports. Bart, Bart rides up in the front seat today because he's a good guy at sports. To be tall. He's so tall and handsome to be romantically successful. Check out my girlfriend. She's in Canada. Yeah. She migrated. She's not made up. Okay. Look at her. Look at her. She exists wrong. To be funny. Did you ever notice how men always leave the toilet seat up? That's the joke. You suck, McBain! <laughs> to be boisterous, to drink, play poker. The guy's going to play poker. That's a real fun of poker tonight, you boys guy. Can you play poker? God, I love poker night. To engage in locker room talk, which is often derogatory towards women, and to suppress emotions, except for anger. I'm just passionate, like all us Greeks. No, you're angry. Look, you're punching the cat right now. Oh, I am. Oh, my God, you're right. <laughs> I'm a rageaholic. <laughs> I just can't live without rageaholic. It goes without saying that few, if any, men actually want to or can do all of these things. In many cases, achieving them is a Sisyphean task. Once you reach your target at the gym, you start comparing yourself to the guys who are benching even more. As a result, many men feel like failures in one area or another, whether that be romantically, career-wise, physically, or socially. You may see where I'm going with this. Economics has a culture analogous to toxic masculinity. Convinced of their own superiority, yet operating in a highly competitive environment which constantly reminds them of their own shortcomings, economists are insecure and eager to prove that they fit into the mold of what it means to be an economist, resulting in a toxic and harmful rat race which is ultimately good for no one, not even those who win. Partly, this is natural, right? A male-dominated discipline would be expected to display negative traits associated with toxic masculinity. Philosophy, the only other social science where women are as underrepresented as economics, seems to have similar problems with its culture. 
But the specific institutional characteristics of economics that we've detailed give rise to some unique elements of toxicity within the economics profession. As discussed earlier, economists are notable for their fairly rigid and unified core framework. Edward Lazier's paper on economic imperialism identified economics as a set of core tools which can and should be applied to any question. How many times have you heard the expression, thinking like an economist? How often do you hear thinking like a sociologist or an anthropologist, or even a physicist? There's no doubt that a clear set of boundaries and practices exist surrounding what it means to be an economist. This is all probably best illustrated through the case study of seminars. It may sound surprising, but economic seminars can actually be quite dramatic and exhausting affairs. Unlike a traditional presentation where questions are saved until the end, people will interrupt from the beginning, often with critical comments. This tends to surprise people from outside academia who already find presentations terrifying. Having seen your faculty bark negative comments at you before you've really begun is just par for the course in economics. A New York Times article reported I'm just going to stop right here and say that uh, the, the economics sounds terrible. It sounds like there's not very many women in it because it's a fucking horrendous profession uh, that does fake made-up shit and is constantly uh, looking for solutions that are already there <laughs> to problems that don't exist. To me, economists are uh, just kind of spinning wheels. Um, it's funny that they'll end up getting like a Nobel Peace Prize for, I, I don't even know what they're actually doing. Um, I'm sure there is some level of economics that is helpful, but I don't actually know the net benefit of a bunch of people yelling at each other about how money works, I guess. I'm not even sure what the, what the real outcome is. And I'm not just trying to say like, oh, if we were like communist or socialist, there wouldn't there wouldn't be economists because it's going to exist. There's money. People are going to wonder how value is transferred. That's not something that can get wiped out. There's always going to be value that needs to be transferred between entities or people. So there's always going to be economics and and such. There's always going to be people studying it, but it just feels like from his description of the community, um, horrendously uh, self-serving and not that productive, in my opinion. Um, I'd love to look at a more optimistic version of the economics community, um, but this really shows why those guys that are kind of pop up once in a while on the news um, that got that got the pandemic recession completely wrong. Um, it's it's kind of just a lot of self masturbation. Um, I knew this, but this is a this is an eye opening look into the world of economics. I typically do not pay attention. Um, people that are in finance, people that are in investing and stuff like that. To me, um, it's you know if you can do that, that's okay but it's sort of a fantasy thing. You're not, you're not making anything. You're just playing with money. So um, it didn't interest me, doesn't interest me, and it's something where I feel those people's uh, minds could be better used in other places if we just took the smartest of them and figured out how to stop having uh, so many of them around because it doesn't, doesn't seem helpful in my opinion, just having seminars where people are yelling at each other about how to contain capitalism. I'm not even sure what they're, they're talking about in a lot of these seminars. On some research done on economic seminars. A few years ago, the fake, economist so Alicia Sasser Modestino and Justin Wolfers sat at the back of a professional conference and watched Rebecca Diamond, a rising star in their field, present her latest research on inequality. Or at least she was meant to present it. Moments after she began her talk, the audience began peppering her with questions. She must have gotten 15 questions in the first five minutes, including, are you going to show us the data, Dr. Modestino recalled. It was an odd, even demeaning question. The session was in the data-heavy field of applied microeconomics. Of course she was going to show her data. 
Later that morning, Dr. Modestino and Dr. Walfers watched as another prominent economist, Aaron Jajit Dubey, presented a paper on the minimum wage. But while that was one of the most hotly debated topics in the field, the audience allowed Dr. Dubey to lay out his findings for several oh, okay. minutes with few interruptions. Sorry, it sounds like um, that uh, women are trying to talk about real topics in economics, and then the men that are there that are old and fucking creepy, as they described earlier in this video, uh, are are kind of like, oh no, we don't want to fix shit. We just wanted to have our club here where we fucking talk about shit. And we're going to just say that you're wrong because that makes us feel important. And and shut the fuck up, by the way. Your, your time is over, woman. This is horrible, man. Why would anyone want to be in economics? Yeah, no shit. Uh, it's a mystery why there's no women in economics, except economics itself is just a shit show that no one would want to go to. Over a drink later, Dr. Modestino and Dr. Wolfers wondered, had the audiences treated the two presenters differently because of their genders? You may remember the names Aaron Dubey and Rebecca Diamond, because both of them featured in one of uh, my previous videos that question is yes. where I was more skeptical of Diamond's research than Dubey's. Shit. Now, people have reasonably grown tired of online complaints about men that make gross generalizations. The six-month furore over man-spreading was certainly a colossal waste of time. But you would be hard-pressed to find a better example of mansplaining and even man-tructing than in these economic seminars. It actually reminds me of the Mantage, for those of you who remember that far back into YouTube. No, if you're Joe eating me, eating, there's Luke crying openly at Old Yeller. Here's Joe debating a topic of importance. Well, there's Luke waking up without hitting the snooze button. Delicious. Deidre McCloskey once commented that the number one compliment among economists was to say, you're smart. In many cases, people in an economics seminar will try to guess at and explain the paper to the presenter early on, as clearly happened with Rebecca Diamond. Conscious or otherwise, this is an attempt to impress everyone with how intelligent you are and how much you understand economics. I've only seen one slide, but I've already guessed the rest, and here's why I know it's wrong after thinking about it for 30 seconds, even though you've been working on it for years. As we all know on Left YouTube, Judith Butler has argued that masculinity is essentially a performance. Many of the male traits we just mentioned, boisterousness, locker room talk, aggressively pursuing women, are a kind of demonstration to other men that you're a part of the tribe. By engaging in these actions, you create your identity as a man. Is it not a performance too? Proving your worth in seminars by loudly critiquing papers after a single slide? I have myself been positively reinforced for asking these kinds of questions in seminars. Demonstrating that you belong in economics by doing these economisty things could be considered analogous to demonstrating that you are masculine by doing manly things. Am I pushing the analogy between gender and economics too far? Probably. Did I understand all of Judith Butler? No. What are you going to do about it? You've already watched most of the video anyway. Returning to Wolfers and Modestino, a great name by the way, they did some systematic research about all this by gathering data from seminars. They found that women were asked about 12% more questions than men, and also that the questions they were asked were more likely to be patronising or hostile. I wonder why women don't like economics. No doubt, there is value in getting critical feedback on your work. In the same New York Times article, the economist Ioana Marinescu, uh, sorry if I've pronounced that wrong, defended the seminar process as stimulating. In my experience, it's rationalized as, if we don't critique your work now, someone else will further down the line, when it's too late. But there are ways of asking questions and critiquing which do not involve overt displays of dominance. And the, it's for your own good argument can only take us so far. Abusive parents say that. Ultimately, what's to blame is the toxic environment that gives rise to these behaviours. Speaking of which... We are now going to talk about the website Economics Job Market Rumours, or EJMR for short. For those of you blissfully unaware, EJMR is an anonymous internet forum for professional economists. Ostensibly designed for graduate students to anonymously find out information... Before he even finishes, this sounds like a, a minefield of a website. Don't want to go there. Very intrigued to know about it. About 
jobs. It quickly descended into a cesspit filled with the worst tendencies of the discipline and of the internet. On an average day in EJMR, you'll mostly find boring, albeit obsessive posts about how the job market is going, whether this or that journal or school is sufficiently respected to bother with, and complaints about virtually every economist under the sun, from random ones on Twitter to literal Nobel Prize winners. To take a random example, Who is your favourite economist at Oxford? Mine is David Henry for his fundamental contributions to the macroeconomic science. Mike McCheese, their great new hire. Oh, and Henry is a joke. David Henry is the father of modern macroeconometrics. Henry is a total loser, completely isolated in the profession. No nutty takes him seriously outside of Oxford. Kidding me? Henry will kick your ass by getting Nobel in the next five years. And so on. This forum is ridiculous. These are supposedly academics. Supposedly. There's no way of knowing for sure. Observers have compared EJMR to many things, including 4chan, but I think it resembles more closely another niche internet forum, the Involuntary Celibate, or Incels. Natalie Wynn at ContraPoints has a famous and excellent video exploring incels and their culture. Short for involuntary celibate, the word incel was invented in the late 90s by a lonely bisexual called Alana, who created a website called Alana's Involuntary Celibacy Project that was essentially a safe space for people who just couldn't get it in. But in our own miserable moment of internet history, the word incel refers to a more specific community of mostly heterosexual men, centered around forums like incel.me and r slash brain this group has recently gotten a lot of bad press because for the last few years they've been churning out mass murderers faster than Marvel can make Avengers movies. If incels are the bottom feeders of toxic masculinity, EJMR is the bottom feeder of toxic economics. The parallels are closer than you might think at first glance. For example, incels tend to split the world into alphas, normies, and incels. Alphas are the good-looking guys with strong jaws who get all the girls while incels are jawless losers who are unable to get a girlfriend. In the middle, normies, who make up the majority of men, must settle for the women that the alphas don't want. Normies are mildly successful in romance, certainly more so than the incels, but are ultimately the target of Aya because they are second tier. EJMR have a strangely analogous way of seeing the world. They like to separate people into categories too, but the terms they use are HRMs, MRMs and LRMs. HRM stands for High Ranked Monkey, which is short for someone who is at a top school and publishes in the top five journals. MRM stands for Medium Ranked Monkey, someone at a slightly inferior school who might publish in the top five journals from time to time. LRM stands for Low Ranked Monkey, people at schools which are not highly regarded and who will not get into the top five or even top ten journals. There are countless threads on the forum asking which universities belong in which category, and in keeping with the hierarchical nature of the discipline, there's not much space in the top two tiers of HRM and MRM. Most people are in the LRM category. This differs from the incels because in their taxonomy, the bottom is in the minority, while most men sit in the middle as normies. But that's not the most important point here. ContraPoints concludes that the incel movement is basically just a vehicle for self-hatred. Although hatred is directed outwards, especially towards people who don't conform to traditional standards, there's also a lot of hatred directed inwards. Consider the opening clip from ContraPoints' video. Imagine how a woman feels. Imagine how soft and warm her skin feels. Imagine the sweet smell of her perfume. Imagine her tenderly pressing her soft lips against yours. Imagine her letting you get on top of her and insert your inside her, softly moaning as it slides in. Imagine the walls of her tight, soft, warm wrapped around every inch of your Imagine her breathing getting heavier with every thrust. Imagine her wrapping her arms and legs around you, holding you as close as she possibly can, and begging you to inside her as you release every ounce of your into her. Then imagine the feeling of pure satisfaction and peace that comes afterwards, and looking beside you to see a person that cares about you and has accepted you in the most intimate way possible. You will never get to experience this, because your skeleton is too small, or the bones in your face are not the proper shape. Have a nice day. Now, compare and contrast with this EJMR post. 
The snubby posts on this form are getting out of hand. So many people post about how crappy certain journals are, how low rank certain departments are, and how easy it is to get tenure at shitty schools. But WTF, do you losers know? Most of you are only in grad school. Who knows if you'll even get placed in academia? Trust me when I say this. Those of you who are knocking journals that aren't top five or top field pubs will probably never publish in a top five and will have a lot of trouble publishing in top field. Most of you will also never get placed at a place you would consider decent and you'll certainly end up getting tenure if anywhere at a place you might think is below you. The profession is much harder than you think and 99% of people down the ranks their entire career. I'm an AP at a non-top 50 school right now, which most likely I'll get denied tenure in a few years and have to move on to a teaching college. I got my PhD at a top 15 and did my undergrad at an Ivy. Most of my colleagues have the same pedigree, but that doesn't mean we move up in the profession the way you all think you will. Moral of the story, knock journals and departments after you get a job and or tenure. Until then, GTFO. The EGMR post is less directly creepy, and there's an element of trying to push against the hierarchy in economics, but the takeaway is ultimately the same. You are a loser, and it's time to accept that. There are fairly frequent reminders on the forum that most EJMR posters are in fact themselves low-ranked monkeys, lest anybody get carried away. There is, in other words, a lot of self-hatred on the forum. Economist Ben Harrell calls the realization that you won't get into the upper echelons of the discipline the economic red pill, much like the incel red pill of realizing you'll never get laid. And it has similar effects, leading to the blaming of women and minorities who have displaced you. In some ways, the analogy with incels is not really an analogy at all. It's not uncommon to find words like alpha, beta, and simp repeated on EJMR, the same terms used by incels and the broader so-called manosphere. Nor is it uncommon to see posts complaining about not being able to get a girlfriend, or otherwise complaining about women in some way. If I can't get a girlfriend, there's no point to any of this. Why bother? Where do you need attractive, intelligent women these days? It was hard enough before COVID. I am talking 130 plus IQ. My GF was a whore before she met me. She is 33 and wants to get married. Thinks the world of me, but had sex with lots of guys before me. I've only had three partners total. A party of me wants to dump her for per this. But the other part of me knows what I'm looking for is a unicorn. Not sure what to do. In fairness, you can see this last one was downvoted with four gerbs and 12 no gerbs, and there are some comments criticizing the original poster, so there is hope. One especially sad post is titled, No Friends, No Girlfriend, No Talent and Motivation for Research. Though posted seven years ago, it regularly gets bumped up with people saying they feel similar. The economist Alice Wu looked into the issue of misogyny on EJMR. We found that posts about women are 43% less likely to contain professional words like career, tenure, professor, or Keynesian. They are 192% more likely to contain personal words such as kids, beautiful, sexual, and fat. I wonder why women don't like economics. Some may argue that the over... All right, well, that is definitely more than half an hour. If you want to finish that, you can just click the link in the description down below. My sun is up, so I gotta go, and that has been today of guitar. My name's Jamie. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Keep playing.